This is the 9 inch differential out of the car. I'm going to be swapping the gear sets because the ones I've been using uh, are showing quite a bit of wear from last year. It might have been something I got messed up on the setup or just uh, how these gears are because these are used uh, NASCAR gear sets that I've been running. They're all super lightweight. So, I mean, I got a whole season out of it, so I'm not too mad about that. I just want to swap it out to be safe, and we're going to do a little bit of a gear ratio change. Well, this stuff certainly smells good. Let's see how it cleans. First time trying this out. It's not bad. Oof, I might have to space this up though. I don't know about this bending over shit. Probably have safety glasses on too. Yeah. All right, while this video is fast forwarding, I can talk about what I'm doing a little bit. This is the this cheap spray washer tank I picked up at a bargain store. Kind of got lucky finding it. It was sitting underneath the shelf collecting dust and been marked down a few times already. So I was kind of excited about that because this is a nice uh, all stainless steel, pretty high end unit. It just didn't have the tank on the bottom. In which case I uh, have a 30 gallon plastic drum that I picked up for 20 bucks. So got that nice and cheap and then ordered some of the actual safety clean uh, four in one cleaner stuff. It's biodegradable, it's safe on your hands, it's not toxic or anything like that, like Scandosol or other solvent based stuff would be. And if it was solvent based stuff, I'd need to have gloves on right now, and obviously the plastic tank wouldn't be holding up. So this is a nice in small garage kind of a solution, especially for me. I mean, I'm sick and tired of going through cases and cases of brake cleaner every year just for cleaning stuff because I really don't have another good way to clean it. So now I have this. And it does a pretty good job so far. So I like seeing that. But all that cleaning and it quickly reveals that uh, this thing got seriously hot. I mean, it's just black burned up by the gears. Anything away from the gears is just fine, but the gear teeth themselves obviously saw some serious heat so i don't know it's interesting because i mean the bearings bearings all look great but i don't know clearly i messed something up last time or just didn't have enough uh, cooling for the rear end all right i've had a minute to ponder what's going on with the rear end why the gear teeth got so hot but everything else looks fine i don't know that it's something got screwed up as far as setting up the ring gear i think it's just a lack of lubrication 
And my reasoning for that is because with the racing that I'm doing, especially on road course stuff where you have big, long corners at high G load, it could have been taking all that fluid that was in the rear end and either putting it all to one side where it wasn't getting on the gears or it was putting it all down the axle tube and essentially the center section was dry. And that kind of makes sense because then all the bearing the bearings would still had a little bit of lubrication holding on to them and they would have survived just fine being dry for a little bit but the gear faces themselves would have been completely dry of lubrication at that point and then continuing to build heat and wear so thinking about that as far as going forward i'll have less of that to worry about because now with the floater rear end that i'm putting in that will be um, greased bearings on the outsides and I actually have some inner seals in order to keep all of the fluid right in the center diff section. So actually this problem should probably solve itself with the changes I'm making. And this is why I had safety wire on them. I haven't even loosened this. There's another one that's loose. There's one that's loose. Makes three. four. Four that are just lightly tapping on it that came loose. And I ended up putting safety wire on them last winter because that fall before I came home from a race because I had no gears and I thought I broke something in the transmission and what it was was the whole ring gear fell off because all the bolts came out. So you can see that uh, clearly this is the thing because these even had Loctite and they were torqued to spec and they still came loose so it, maybe it's just from the heat buildup or there's just enough vibration and stuff going on that they loosen up. I'm really glad I had the safety wire on them because that kept me from having a problem last year. see how nice lightweight this ring gear was and I believe my new one is the same. Now this is a bearing splitter. If you never used one of these before, it's for being able to angle in underneath a bearing and remove it from a press fit on a shaft. There's a little bit of air gap down underneath here where we were able to get the flange underneath the center of the bearing. We don't want it touching the outside. As you can see, the outside cage still moves freely. If that was stopped at any and we tried to push this out, it's going to bend the cage. So we don't wanna be doing that. So I wanna make sure that this still spins freely. We've got the tangs underneath the center section, which is the same as this piece here, around the top. And then we'll be able to press on this pinion and remove it.
Now with everything cleaned up, I can press the bearing that I took off the old pinion onto the new pinion and then we'll go through setting up the solid pinion spacer so that when the bearings and the housing go onto the pinion that we have the correct tension on the tapered roller bearings. One of the things to look for while inspecting these is look at the races. I can see that this is a nice, smooth, uniform surface on here. And there's no pits, there's no gouges, there's none of that kind of stuff. There's just a little bit of dried stuff on there I can wipe off. But we're wanting to make sure that anything suspect is looked at or completely removed in the case of if these races were beat up and then same thing with the bearing rollers. We want to look at these and go through them and I've already done it and spin each one and kind of just feel for any flat spots, look for pitting, anything like that. You'll be surprised how bad these things can be and still function but I'd rather replace the stuff now than have to be have it hanging over my head that maybe the thing will fail later in the season. That's all. Now that I've checked all of these, I'm ready to put stuff back together. Now you don't have to have a press to be able to put bearings like this on the pinion or even on the center differential. I've actually done this before where you can heat up the bearing and you can chill the pinion or whatever you're trying to install a part on that's press fit. Um, actually what I did last time before I had a press was I, I took a bearing just like this and I just set it right on top of my uh, stove top in the house. I have like a, a glass plate top electric stove. And I just set the bearings right on top of that, turned a burner on, and just kind of kept an eye on it and waited. Meanwhile, you need to have something to, you know, finish hammering at home. But the idea is to heat it up enough there that it'll expand past the press fit to make a slip fit, at which point it was able to just kind of drop it on. And more or less it was uh, where you could just, it'd be even warmer, it'd drop on just like that. So this is actually a different size because it's where the other bearing sits. But how that just slides on, it'd drop on like that most of, if not all the way. And then I'd, I would have had the lower shaft here with some lubrication on it. And while that's hot, obviously gloves, everything there. Drop it on and then I could take this piece of pipe or whatever I had at the time and then just hit it with a hammer to drive it all the way home quick. But I'm not going to bother doing it like that because I do have a press now so I'm just going to press it on. You will want to make sure that whatever you're pressing with is touching that inner race. All right, now it's not noisy. <laughs> no. Just like when we remove the bearing off the old pinion, you want to make sure that what you're pulling or pressing against is the inner race area of the bearing. We do not want to damage the roller cage. So I have this piece of tube, it's touching the inner. I can still spin this roller cage. It doesn't have any tension on it. So that's a safe way to push this on. And I heard the pressure come up on the air. That means we're bottomed out all the way. I can visually see that as well. We don't need to keep pressing anymore. We're just stressing parts out. Now with setting up the pinion spacing, we have these shims 
that will go in between the two bearings. And what that's to do is to set the depth between them in this pinion housing. And the reason we need to do that is because if we didn't have anything in there, the more you torque down the yoke when you put all this together, it would actually start crushing this together and you could tighten it up so much it's impossible for it to actually turn. The factory has like a crush sleeve style, so you have to be very careful when putting them together. Otherwise, there's these solid type ones where we can add or remove shims as needed to set the tension. What we're looking for is just like uh, if you ever set a wheel bearing before, we want enough tension to take all of the slop out of the system, but we don't want it so tight that we're creating a whole bunch of drag on the pinion being able to spin in the housing. So these are all the same pieces I had in there previously. I'm just going to wipe them down quick, make sure there's no grit or anything between them that might throw off our ability to check it. So this is a demonstration of not having enough shim in there, is this is now locked up tight. So that's way too much tension on the bearings where now it won't even rotate. So this is where it's a little bit of back and forth to try out different shim thicknesses. I purposely left it short just to demonstrate this. So now I'll take it back apart and add some more shims. Now this is demonstrate too many shims. You can see that there's slop between the bearings even though the pinion is down bolted down tight. So we need to find a happy medium there where we have free rotation, but we don't have any slop. Now here I'm getting pretty close, but there's just a tiny amount of slap in there yet, so. This is where the caliper comes in handy. I can take one shim, thicker shim that I have on here off. It is 13 thousandths thick. So we'll try to see what we have for options here. I'm going thinner. We have, oh, we got a bunch of them here that are super thin. Got like a three and a six. So that'll make it nine. So that'd be like four thousandths less than what we had last time. So we can give that a try. Still just a little bit of slop in there. So we'll take the six out and see what happens. There, my slop is gone. It spins nice and freely. I think that's a good spot to be in. So That's how you set the shim stack for the pinion spacing. Now with the pinion spacing set, I don't want to just put all the stuff together dry, so we'll uh, add some oil. just to get some lubrication on everything. There we go. Put our shim stack back on. Now we have this uh, 
splash shield. I would call it there. Basically, all it is is just to keep the gear oil from going, trying to go past the splines and leak out. And then we'll need to put our seal back on. But actually, we can pull this back off and get that seal hammer back on. Okay. We'll put a little lube on the seal. You never want to just put a seal on dry. It's a good way to burn them up pretty quickly. Typically it's not a bad idea to replace the pinion nut because it's kind of a a locking nut for the most part. Um, I don't have another one right now, but uh, I'm just gonna put red Loctite on it because when we were checking, it st still seemed to be quite tight. All right, now with everything tight on there, I still have nice free movement. I can't spin it completely like I did before, but now we have the extra drag of the seal on here as well. And being, you know, it's still nice, free, smooth movement. It's not binding up or anything like that. This will also loosen up a little bit when it gets heat in it too. So I'm pretty happy with that. Now we'll move on to doing the rest of the ring gear. Now because this is a used ring gear and the holes all have a bunch of Loctite debris left over in them, I'm just going to chase them with the tap to try to clean all that stuff out. Now we need to put the ring gear on. Got all the holes cleaned out. And this just sets on. But it's a very tight fit. Probably want to try to get the bolt holes lined up ahead of time. So there are two different length ring gear bolts. You need to make sure that you have the correct one for whatever ring gear you're putting on. Uh, I originally had a set of the short ones and then I had a ring gear that came with long ones but I didn't actually use those because I went with a different ring gear and I had to buy a new set of short ones so something to be aware of if you're changing ring gears you may have to change the bolt that hold, bolts that hold them on but in this case having the long ones there it'll be nice because I can use it for a starter to align the ring gear and I can do that by just taking two of them putting them in opposite sides Just getting the thread started. Helps if you make sure everything's squ if it's square ahead of time, that way you can get more than a few threads in there. All right, now we have the two bolts in there that can help guide this down. And now with the ring gear seated, we can swap to the bolts we're actually gonna use. I had washers under here on the old ring gear because it actually ran out of threads. This one seems to be threaded deeper, so I actually can get rid of the washers. So that's nice. But before I get too crazy, we'll make sure we can put some Loctite on these. However, I do want to run them all the way down first to make sure that we aren't gonna have any bottoming of threads 
going on. What I'm doing here is I'm checking to make sure that the bolt head is making contact with the differential. Because even if there's ever so slightly of an air gap, then it means that it's bottoming in the threads and getting tight, in which case putting any torque on it isn't going to do anything worth a crap, which this one is up. And it seems to be acting like it's tight. So oh, it's either run out of threads or there's still some junk in the threads. So maybe we'll pull that one back out and chase it again. It looks like maybe it picked up some old Loctite in there. Now it's down all the way. Um, and this is just on the very lowest setting of my impact there. It's not even up to full torque. So if I, as long as I'm getting down all the way with that, I know going to torque them up, I should be good to go. Oh. Now that all of them are confirmed to have enough thread depth, I can pull them back out red Loctite them, and then torque them up. I have found this method of torquing the bolts up using the press to kind of fixture and hold it in place. It won't keep it from rotating completely, so you have to hold on to it a little bit, but at least it keeps it in one place instead of trying to like wrestle and with the thing on the bench. And I'm sure there's a fixture you could buy or make to do this, but for me doing it once a year, it's hardly worthwhile and this works pretty good. When setting up the caps and trying to get the rings where everything lines up, if something doesn't seem, I mean, like, oh yeah, it's got tilt in it there. It's just, it's not quite right. And as you can see here a little closer, I got a little bit of gap on one end and I was fighting with the other side. And sometimes you just gotta look through the top at the holes and see which one's off and lift it up high enough to jump a tooth and look at that, sits right down. And then these threaded rings are how you adjust the ring gear back and forth with the differential to set backlash on the pinion. So I was fighting with the other side. Same thing there, I just gotta look at it and see where it's out of alignment. And hopefully it'll drop in there. But I also noticed I dinged up this one a little bit. Hopefully that can be seen. So I'll hit that with the file. Try not to do the surface, I just want to get the high spot there that's messing me up. It looks like another one on this side. There we go. Huh, look at that, drops right on now. <laughs> Another thing of note is to make sure that the correct cap is on the correct side because they're not perfect, but they're machined together. As you can see, someone has stamped these markings. And the other one has that. And then it also has been stamped A. And there it is. And it's supposed to be B before. So. But really, if you don't have any markings on yours, it can be figured out based on how the threads line up. You'll have to go back and forth between positioning for the 
the holes being lined up and where this ring kind of centers everything. You know, I mean, one side's going to fit and the other one is not at all. So, it can be figured out. If they're not marked, you just gotta take a little more time. If you're getting a fresh rebuild kit, uh, you'll end up with various thickness shims for the pinion. Uh, same, same as how we shim the bearings on the pinion, these different shim thicknesses will be for adjusting the pinion height in the housing. And where that comes in is how it affects the gear tooth mesh. So we'll get into that a little bit later. Typically they'll say start with a certain thickness one, which happens to be this one, because that's usually where you need to be. So we'll put this back on. They're shaped a little differently to match up, so they only go on one way. And then we just bolt the pinion in, and then when we start setting backlash and then checking our wear pattern, that's when these may come into play. See here, I got the marks lined up between the pinion and the ring gear. That way we know that the teeth will re-engage in the same way that they had before. This may also be marked on a brand new set if they're wanting you to line it up in any particular way. If there was a lapping procedure or something like that that happened at the factory. Now that I've got both caps on and the rings and everything set in here, it's still not tight because the races aren't pushed up against the bearings so I'll need to adjust them to do that and then we can start working on setting backlash by moving it either to one side or the other. Um, there's tools for these I just made my own I can stick it in here and then be able to rotate these rings. So now once I've got them tight, basically I'm going back and forth with each side until I'm pushing as much as I can with the, with each side to lock it in. Because you want to make sure that those races are pushed in tight to those bearings. Because if they're twisted ever so little bit, it's actually if they settle then this ring gear would actually, and differential would be super loose in there. So that's why I want to make sure those are nice and tight. We can always back them off a little bit later in order to free up the bearing because you don't need a ton of pressure on them. Just like the pinion, we just want to take the slack out and make sure that it spins free without putting undue pressure on it. But at this point, now that we've got all the wiggle out of it, that little click you can hear, that's the backlash. That's a little bit that's moving. I don't even know if it measure a whole lot, but we can get the gauge set up and see what we have right now. Now this is checking the backlash, which is just the little bit of air gap distance from one side to the other. And as you can see, it looks like it's about three. We can always turn the indicator to zero it out. Yeah, it's where like, yeah, three thou there which is definitely not enough so we'll need to adjust that. Now in order to increase 
the backlash, because the pinion is on this side, we'll need to move the ring gear this way. And we'll do that by adjusting the nuts on each side. As you can see, that little adjustment made a huge amount because I went about a half a turn. And now we have, let's see, one, two and a half, two, twelve, almost 15 thousandths a lash, which is too much. So I'll back it up a little bit because I'm shooting for about 10. And we're right about nine and a half. Well, that's a pretty good spot to be. All right, now I loosened up this side because after I spun it a couple of times there, the lash was like eight in a few places. So I just uh, moved this ring so where the lock hole here lines up on the other side that also took a little bit of tension off of the bearings. To help loosen them up. Now we need to check what the wear pattern looks like. So this is some setup grease or whatever you want to call it for checking this stuff. And we want to check both the drive side and the coast side. I'm just going to put some on there. Usually you got a brush or something if you got enough of the stuff to smear it around and get a good coating on there. I just have this little tube so it's kind of a pain in the butt, but <clears throat> needs to be checked, but we want to make sure that we're going to see all of where the tooth engagement is. So I'll just smear it around. And then we're just going to rotate it through. Make sure you're going the right uh, direction. So this way is going to be the drive. And then we're going to want to put a little bit of tension on here. Just to make some pressure to help smear that fluid around. And the other way. And we can see what we came up with. So there's our marks for, I believe, the drive side. And the coast side. Pretty narrow but they're fairly centered on there, so that's not bad. But uh, I'll get all my books so I can double check this stuff. I've only done this a few times, so I'll make sure we're talking about the right thing. All right, I've saved this book, Yukon booklet from when I bought a gear set, just because it's nice to have for reference. So it's got acceptable patterns, uh, pinion too close and pinion too far away kind of pattern, so we just gotta find a picture here and see what matches up. So, looking at the, basically the bad stuff, I can tell that it's none of those because the pinion too far away seems to be riding high and neither one of them are like that and the pinion too close seems to be towards the bottom and they're neither of those. And we're none of these because they're not way off to the side. So I think we're really, this is about our closest match up there. I mean, if you look at it there, it's not too bad. And then same thing on the other side. One other thing that I'm choosing to look at here is 
So here's a little bit of transfer that we can see. And this extra shiny part right there, as you can see where it was wearing in its previous application. And that's fairly comparable tooth to tooth. So I like that where I know that I'm not too far off. And kind of the same thing here on the coast side. You can see that older wear pattern and where the little bit of transfer grease is. That seems to match up pretty good. I mean, it's landing right in the same spot, so. I may not get the full pattern because of the amount of pressure just holding my hand on it would ever show. But to say that uh, this is a setup that will work where it's spaced out is good to go. Now since I only have these cap bolts snugged up so that I was able to move the rings back and forth a little bit easier, I'll loosen these up and get some Loctite on them, snug them back down and then get them torqued up. And then we'll double check the backlash just to make sure. But you guys don't need to see all that. The other thing I'm sure somebody's asking by now is why I don't have the safety wiring on. And that's because I was looking at what I had for wire that one of the ones that I did take off was actually broken. So I'm hoping to get some little bit bigger wire. And then I don't actually have a tool. I was borrowing it from my dad because he's got it for some airplane stuff. So I actually just ordered my own tool because I've already you know, done this once, I borrowed the tool, like, ah, whatever, and then now I'm needing again, and I know there's uh, some of the steering rack stuff in the front end of the car was coming loose also, so the plan is to safety wire that, and then I've I found a, a tool to order for being able to, like, use as a jig to drill bolts of, uh, I think it was quarter inch up to five eighths for safety wiring. And unlike these ones where I did it in the middle where I went straight through the center, I think it looks like it's actually gonna be an offset one to help put more tension on to keep them tight. So while I'm still gonna use these bolts that are on center, I just wanna get them safety wired so nothing comes loose and falling apart like it did two years ago. And I wanna be able to safety wire some more stuff in the front end of the car just, well, for safety, <laughs> obviously. But uh, yeah, I'll get these torqued up and double check the backlash and when I get the tools in in a couple of days we'll get them safety wired. Now that I've got the caps torqued up and I had to recheck the lash and adjust it a little bit but mostly I ended up in the same spot but might have 11 thou instead of 10 now. Got the hole lined up with this lock which it's just this little piece of metal and a screw. So put some Loctite on these, put them in, and then that's what keeps these uh, adjuster rings from spinning and coming loose when it's running. And I might have to find a different solution. This one is very stripped out. I'll have to see what I got. All right, I happen to have a similar flathead screw that I could, it was longer, so I just had to cut it off. So I got a new screw on this side. That's Loctited in. I added oil to the bearings and turned it over so at least they got some lubrication. I'm not gonna try to start all that stuff dry. And I did go back and torque these up in the front that hold the pinion on. Oh, um, other than the safety wire on the bolts, uh, this thing's ready to go again. Safety wire and tools came in, so now I'll finish up the rear end. Now the purpose of the safety wire is to keep these bolts from completely backing out should they come loose. So we need to be putting the safety wire around the bolt in a way where it's going to hold it towards the tight side. So we're gonna want this wire to be wrapping around this outside of the bolt and then go to this side of this bolt so that both of them are trying to pull in a 
clockwise rotation where it'll keep them tight. I can start with just one of the bolts. All we do is shove the wire through. Pull it through roughly halfway. It doesn't matter if you have extra. Now we're going to want to have the twist be closer to this side. That way it's creating that tension. So I'm going to bend that side over a bit to get them over here and then twist them together a little bit just to start. You can do all this twisting by hand but the tool makes it a lot easier. And I'm just going to press them together downstream a little bit. We can clamp them, lock it in, and then we'll pull the twist. And we're going to want to have enough twist in it to get up to the next hole that we want in the next bolt. I'm a little bit shy of that, so we'll put a, just a couple more twists in it. can always take a few out, so now I'm a little bit past, so I'm just going to back the twists out until I get one that's going to line up almost exactly with that hole. So that looks like it's pretty close. I'm going to take this wire, push it through, pull it through the rest of the way, so we can get that nice tight fit there. And then I can pull it around the rest of the way and then we can continue our twist to lock it in place. and clip the excess. Now if these bolts were to try to back out, they'd have to rotate counterclockwise. As you can see, if this one tries to rotate counterclockwise, this wire from the other one will hold it. And vice versa is that this one tries to rotate counterclockwise, the wire will also hold it. And should either one try to loosen, it will tighten the other. So at some point it's only going to loosen so far till the wire gets completely tensioned tight. And then the bolt will stay in and not completely fall out. That's what the safety wire is for. And that concludes swapping out the ring gear on my Ford 9 inch and getting it prepped for next race season. Uh, thanks for sticking around this long. Hope you learned something that you can apply to working on stuff in your own garage. And have a good day.